Uh, a number of you have asked about availability of slides. Uh, Dr. Monroe had some really cool slides also. Um, so we're working with all the presenters and we'll make the slides that we can available on quantumworldcongress.com. I've got a little bit of uh, exciting breaking news to share with you right now from one of our presenting sponsors. This is quite cool. Uh, the Boeing Company, now headquartered right here, right across the river in Arlington, Virginia, um, right across the river, has just announced this morning that they will conduct the world's first flight using fully quantum navigation system, and they're going to do it in the first quarter of 2023. So uh, to Jay Lowell and his team, we'll give you a big congrats on that. We'll look forward to uh, seeing that flight in the air. Exciting news. Okay. Our next speaker, Dr. Jay Gambetta, is an IBM fellow and he's vice president of IBM's Quantum Initiative. And under his leadership, IBM has made a number of major strides and breakthroughs in quantum computing and, uh, and in the development uh, and the furtherance of IBM's quantum strategy. Hopefully he'll share some about the IBM quantum experience. It's the world's first cloud-based quantum platform called Quiskit, and uh, he did his physics work uh, at Griffith University in Australia, and we're pleased to have him with us here today at the Quantum World Congress. Please welcome Dr. Jay Gambetta. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everyone. Uh, is the mic working? Yep. Thanks, everyone, for uh, taking a few minutes to listen to me. I'm going to... Um, give a little bit of a talk about IBM Quantum. I've decided I want to start most of my talks by restating our mission. I think many of you know our mission associated with our, our quantum computing, but just as, in, uh, just as important, we've been actually working on quantum safe. At IBM, we are very actually proud of the fact that three of the four um, NIST approved algorithms were co-developed with IBM, and we've been working on quantum safe just as long as actually we've been um, bringing and putting uh, cloud computing uh, to our user. So our mission is basically we want to bring useful quantum computing to the world, and we also want to, at the same time, make sure the world is quantum safe as we go through in this journey. I'm going to go into my talk, which is going to talk more about um, one little topic of how and why we are getting so confident that we'll do, with, uh, do something with quantum computing in the near future. But um, before I wanted to state something that I wanted to just say something that's passionate to me is I think we need to also make sure we're building this quantum industry. When I think of the quantum industry, I actually try to break it up into five different parts. The center one I call advancing quantum. From day one, and it was just mentioned when I um, was introduced, we've always asked how do we actually make sure we bring to our users quantum computing? We've committed to open source, open science. Um, on average, every day, four billion quantum circuits get run on our systems. We are close to, I think, two trillion jobs have been run on our systems since we put it on the cloud in 2016. I think now, with all the technology, we need to get a little bit more focused, so we're really focusing on these technical working groups, and I may, may say something more about that later. But outside of that, we're also being focused on how do we actually build what I call quantum initiative centers, and how do we partner? Today, we have over 35 different um, partnerships with um, various different partners that focus on how do we actually develop the workforce, how do we do R&D, how do we bring access, and uh, as mentioned yesterday, the, the HBCU uh, partnership is one of these ones showing how we're actually bringing quantum to a much more diverse community, which I, I am very proud about. In terms of industry adoption, since we made the quantum network, which was our goal to work out how we collaborate with our partners in a strong way, there's over 200 different members that are working with us on how will quantum computing matter, how, and, and now um, as we bring more of our quantum safe offering in, how will we actually focus on that? What I'm most excited about going into this year is I think the software and the hardware is maturing that we need to ask the question of how can the stack have multiple different components. So we are very committed to working with all our startup partners of real, true application service integration. And we'll see this as with year goes forward. Then finally, quantum safe. 
I, I, the only thing I would point out here, and in a much longer talk I could say a lot more, the IBM uh, Z16 mainframe is already quantum safe. So the fact that we've been working on quantum safe for so long, we've been able to put this into our commercial products as we go forward. So everyone thinks of quantum computing, and to me there's a lot of noise. I know there's a lot of information up here, but I don't really want to focus on it, other than to get across the concept that, for me, the fundamental thing of quantum computing is I want to run these things called quantum circuits. And what these quantum circuits are, people say, oh, am I doing the measurement-based model, the gate-based model, circuit model? They really doesn't matter. I need to be able to send a set of instructions to my hardware and be able to run them and with some, some sense of reliability and fidelity. And so on that, we, we, we developed this thing we call the extended quantum circuit. It's nothing original, but we made sure that there was an open source um, st specification with a technical steering committee that comprises IBM, uh, Amazon, even Microsoft, and Innsbruck, of, of generalizing this concept of the set of instructions. The important thing here is it's much more than just operations. It's a set of gates, the quantum operations, as well as measurements. You can think of this as the packet that needs to go and run on our quantum computer. Furthermore, I think you've probably heard, in my view, you hear, is it NISC? Is it fault tolerance? Is it quantum inspired? I think these are all just confusing, uh, personally. Uh, when I think of NISC, I actually think people are just saying, let's just hope and do something and see what happens. When I think of fault tolerance, even though I know what the definition of fault tolerance, and I'm happy to argue with everyone, there's been come, let's build a logical qubit. That's the most important thing we need to do. When I think of quantum inspired, it's oh, learn about quantum algorithms. But in my view, they're exactly the quantum algorithms that don't require the quantum circuits to run on a hardware that matters. So you're learning about the wrong quantum circuits. So you actually need to focus on what are those quantum circuits that I need to run. And this can scale even like we've known on the left is um, Da Vinci's criteria, which I saw in the video today, that laid out all the ingredients. You can think of this as describing a quantum circuit. The same would be true for logical. So if we just accept the fact that at a high level, I need to run these quantum circuits, and they need to be faithful and accurate for them to be useful. So if we go down this path, is there a different path that we can start to get confident that we can run quantum circuits on our hardware and bring them to you with a sense of error bars, reliability, so that we can be confident we are creating a tool that will be useful for finding these applications we're so passionate about. So is there a different path? In Chris's talk, he talked about a bit of uh, suppressing errors. I disagree with him on the definition of mitigation, and when I first used the definition of mitigation, I had something in mind, and I'll say what that is as I go forward in the next slide. But error suppression, is definitely something we need to do. If you've got ideas of how you can remove errors by inserting pulses and other techniques that can get rid of some of these coherent errors, of course do it. He showed uh, some examples. Here's just an example of inserting pi pulses to make, say, a T1, uh, <coughs> sorry, a T2 experiment look better. Don't want to go into the details other than say, on the top is some circuit that someone would like to run. You need to have open software that makes it all complicated. And you see the difference between the blue and the pink, by just inserting these gates, can make a huge difference in the quality of the circuit when you compare it to this ideal simulation. So we need all these ideas. We need all these smart compiler techniques that go into error suppression. But error suppression will only get us so far. And when we think of this quantum circuit, and I just plot quantum circuit complexity on the bottom, whether it's the number, whether it is going to be related to the number of qubits and the depth, the reason why we're so hopeful about quantum computing is the classical quantum uh, simulation cost goes with this red curve, and it goes exponential. Shaw showed that error correction allows us to get rid of this red curve, and then many years, others have improved it and get basically a flat, uh, the polynomial curve, the, the green curve. But the overhead of doing the error correction of going from zero to one is basically what everyone, when well, you hear these numbers, I need a million qubits before I can do anything, or things like this. And so we are all excited because this will cross at some point. But what we've been working on since um, 2017 is a concept we call error mitigation. This concept is, can I remove error bars in a reliable way? I am okay 
if the runtime of my experiment is still exponential if the base of that exponential is less than the base that a simulation would cost. And so you can actually formalize this. Um, for those that are interested, they can read the, the PRL in uh, 2017. And you can start to write a runtime for that experiment. And that runtime is essentially three things. It's how fast does the experiment run? What quality goes into it? So this gamma parameter, and how many qubits? In longer talks, you'll hear, always hear me saying the most important thing to keep driving hardware is keep pushing scale, quality, and speed. Uh, at the recent update uh, at the IBM Quantum Summit, we uh, took the scale up to 433. We showed some improvements in the quality, and I'll discuss them a bit more now. And we made a 15 times improvement in the speed. And this all comes into when I want to run these circuits, I want them to run fast enough that I get some results back. So where are we? We put this gamma parameter. And here I've plotted it for three different experiments. Uh, 65 qubit Brooklyn, 65 qubit Ithaca, an internal device that's getting close to three nines on average uh, fidelity. And you see that it's going down from 1.03, 1.024, 1.012. If I calculate what I need to do to start to cross that point I talked about before, it's around 1.08. So we're getting close. We're not there yet. But we're systematically making improvements getting closer. But nevertheless, we can start to look at these problems. Here's a recent experiment we did. We did this experiment. We ran random quantum circuits on 65 qubits, depth 15, and we looked at uh, results when we can easily simulate it and it, in areas where we cannot easily simulate it. I'm not saying, I'm going to not say anything about quantum advantage here or anything on those ways, but we see that the mitigated, where we can see it, actually gives exactly what we expect when we can simulate it. When we're in this regime where we cannot simulate it easily, I'm pretty confident tensor methods will be able to simulate this. You can see that the, the mitigated signal is much different to the raw signal, so it's starting to show that we're doing this tool in this interesting regime. <coughs> we can even go further. Um, up the top is a 50 qubit experiment looking at every possible observable you would want uh, to measure out to 50 qubits, uh, sampling from each one of the weights. And you see that all of the weights are almost one, saying that I can get every correlation I needed out of that quantum circuit by doing this error mitigation technique. And down the bottom is a recent result on 127 qubits at depth 36. This is the largest ever quantum circuit ever run. And it's, it's definitely getting into the point that's interesting. The part this is we're only looking at low weight, uh, low weight observables from the circuit. So I've got some, um, we've got some more work before I want to get confident at this. But this all, all sets us up for us believing that we're getting to this point, that we're running this packet, this thing that is important. So one of the things that we've actually set ourselves for is we've set ourselves a challenge that we believe by the end of 2024, we will be able to run 100 qubit circuits of depth 100 within a day. And that is our goal. And so now, what I, if in a longer term, what, we, what I think we need to do is we need to start to ask the question, what do we do with this? This is why these uh, work groups I mentioned before are so important. How do we actually start to get application roadmaps that can be based on the size of the circuits that can be implemented? And my goal and the work that we're working towards is how can we get application roadmaps in finance? We have so many different finance companies that are working with us. High energy physics, we see lots of results coming out. How can we get useful application uh, roadmaps in high energy physics? I was just in CERN talking to the scientists there, and they're getting so excited about this, so I'm looking forward to keep getting this going. How can we get application roadmaps mixing HPC and quantum? In a longer talk, I would have talked about some of the work that we can show. We can offer some of the work associated with quantum into the HPC to do even more. And then finally, and uh, we, we have partnerships like with Cleveland Clinic. How can we get application roadmaps in uh, life sciences? So to me, we're committed to creating this goal. I'm out of time. But I think with this goal, um, by 2024, we'll definitely be in a region where we've got a tool that is not able to be simulated as for us to ask how we will use this tool. And I truly believe this can only be done together. Thank you.
Fantastic, amazing, amazing work that IBM uh, has been doing for quite a while, and thank you, Jay, for those great remarks. Our next panel is about accelerating quantum ecosystems, and who better to moderate such a discussion than a reporter? So Brendan Bordelon is a tech policy reporter and the morning tech author with Politico, and he's gonna guide us through this next discussion. Uh, please welcome Brendan Bordelon to the stage. Thank you. Brendan. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Oh, there it is. Hi, uh, Brendan Bordelon. I'm a tech policy reporter with Politico. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking today about building ecosystems to accelerate quantum's path to value, essentially talking about uh, how to make sort of the industry uh, e ecosystem around this technology, which obviously is still uh, in a pretty nascent stage, uh, but making sure that we can kind of grease the skids for this technology so when it's ready to pop, industry can really get moving. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, have everyone um, here today. Uh, I'm going to start bringing out our, our panelists now. Uh, first up is Dr. Andrew White. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Engineered Quantum Systems. He uh, flew in all the way from Australia, actually. Uh, so please give him a warm welcome because uh, he's a far, long way from home. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Dr. David Ashalam. Uh, he's the director of the Chicago, the Chicago Quantum Exchange. Uh, he's been come from quite so far away, but he's also not local. So uh, if you guys could give him a round of applause as well. So much. Yeah. Uh, finally, we have uh, George Thomas. Uh, he's the Chief Innovation Officer of Connected DMV, and he's also the Director of the Potomac Quantum Innovation Center. Uh, and that's, uh, that rounds us out. So again, uh, <laughs> give applause for everybody. You're too far away, so I'll just say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, well, let's get into it. Um, again, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about industry ecosystems and sort of the broader picture beyond the science here, but uh, you know, I'd be remiss to not start, I think, with the science because uh, it's, you know, I, I don't think I have to tell you guys that this is by no means a mature technology. I think um, you know, it depends really what area you're talking about, but a, a, most of this stuff is like in very early prototyping stages, um, and yet we're talking about how to build an industry ecosystem around this stuff, right? So in a lot of ways, we're kind of like building the airplane while we're trying to fly it, right? So I, I wanna ask you guys, you know, to what extent you guys feel like now is the right time, or why you guys feel like now is the right time to really start talking about industry ecosystems, given the fact that this is some pretty new technology and I don't think folks are quite yet sure where this is all going. Um, I don't know if maybe George wants to start. Uh, thank you, thank you everybody for having us. Um, yeah, it's a very tricky question, uh, not just because of what the technology is, if you take the word quantum and put it to the side and apply any kind of random name into it, the question of building ecosystems to make adoption and commercialization possible have very similar kind of functions that need to be there in the ecosystem. You need workforce and talent, you need uh, money, you need investment in companies that have to go through certain processes that are multiple roadblocks in building an organization. All of that needs to be in place. So in any new technology that's coming along, the trick is always timing when you apply the development of that so you're not developing too soon or you're developing too late. Either one of those is problematic with the hope and the goal that the challenges in science, engineering, and technology are solved at enough of a pace that the other three can take off. In quantum, uh, you know, when I first started hearing about quantum, it was always 30 years away. It started now being a five-year away situation. So I think all the signs from, from, from our perspective seem to be that it is the right time to start building. And the next five years, uh, at most, there will be enough in place for things like adoption and commercialization to be the central issues of talk. David, do you, do you agree? I mean, you're, you're a scientist. Uh, do you feel like the science is mature enough? And I guess it's going to depend on what sort of use case we're talking about, right? And I'd like to get into that. But, you know, let's say for quantum computing, we'll just take that use case. It, are we at a point now where we can start to build, uh, you know, at least the, the bare bones of an industry ecosystem around something like that? And if not, um, you know, what's the timeline look like for you? Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with what George was saying. I think you framed it really well. Uh, there's so many things happening at the same time. So the science developments are mercurial. Sure. Uh, but one thing to me that's very appealing about this field is if you look at the history of nanoelectronics, where a lot of research was done 
uh, in universities, a little bit in industry at the time, the Bell Labs, the IBMs, uh, and then industry came in. This is a chance to do it together from the beginning, right, and blur these distinctions between universities and industries and national labs and work much more efficiently, right, to identify how do you move scientific developments into a technology rapidly and appropriately. Many people like myself may not appreciate the opportunities uh, in the real world for things that are done in the laboratory. I say that with some humility yeah. uh, and having experienced a number of failures in that end. Sure. But uh, so I think this is, a, this is a great way to go. I think the time is now because when you talk to companies, we were chatting just before this session, applied materials and others, and ask them, how long does it take to develop a state-of-the-art tool right, to manufacture technology? And it's typically about 10 years. So if you don't start now, it will be very hard to get in the game. So I think you're right, what you were saying about doing this. And I think for many of us, finally, the biggest challenge will be workforce. Right? Where will people come from? There are no electrical engineering departments that handle this by and large as a focus. I mean, they do, but you know, we have to sort of think about the development of workforce while these things are happening. Mm -hmm. But doing it together, I'm actually very confident we'll hit this. Okay, yeah, I mean, on the workforce question, and if we could just uh, stick with you for one more, Dave, and then Andrew, I'll come to you. Um, this, is, this is obviously, I think, an issue across the STEM ecosystem. It's not just quantum specific. Uh, and, and I guess, uh, you know, one of my questions that I wanted to get to was the extent to which you guys see yourselves sort of in competition with the broader sort of STEM. Uh, again, obviously, there's, there's massive interest in sort of bringing in as much STEM talent as possible to the United States, to Australia. Um, are you guys confident that those folks are going to go into quantum? Uh, you know, whether it's, it's folks coming in uh, from overseas, uh, whether it's folks that are starting um, uh, a degree, you know, that like you can say, hey, I know that the digital platforms are fun and interesting. You know, the chip industry is obviously hiring uh, like, like gangbusters right now in the United States. You should come do quantum stuff instead. I mean, how, how, what, what's that look like? And, and you guys feel confident that um, there's a good path forward there? Well, first of all, I think you should help us recruit. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Not my job. <laughs> well, it could be. Um, so I think two things. One is I think you know, international collaboration will help quite a bit with this because mm -hmm. research projects drive this dynamic and attract students across the board. But I'm not sure that competition is the way to think about this. I mean, I think to many of us, the way to address this problem is to increase the supply by reaching out maybe to communities that have been largely ignored in technology. So in workforce development, you know, electronics appeared and then companies would reach out to places trying to teach them, right, and rapidly fill in these jobs. But, you know, now we have a chance to redefine this equation. How do you build a workforce when a technology is growing? So if one reaches out much more broadly, right, the places that were largely unrepresented in this field and build workforce in these locations, I actually think one could solve this problem. <clears throat> and it's an opportunity to deal with disparity in technology. So I don't view this necessarily as a problem, okay. as a challenge, though, that we might be able to work with really well. Andrew, what does the, the quantum workforce look like in Australia? I mean, that's just an area I think that most of us here probably have a little bit less insight in. But I know Australia is you know, largely seen as a pretty critical node in like, the, the global quantum ecosystem. And so you know, I think before we get into this other stuff, I'm, I'm just curious you know, what, what the, uh, the view from the ground looks like. So for many years, Australia was an exporter of quantum workforce. Mm -hmm. you know, Jay, who was just talking in the last session, mm -hmm. did his undergraduate PhD in Brisbane, for example. Um, PsyQuantum was founded by, uh, founded by Australian uh, graduates. Um, so in, in, at the, the end of PhDs and master's students, it's a uh, very enthusiastic uptake by students. Um, it's also seen as a very attractive field because if, you, if you're working in quantum, you can reskill very easily to be classical electronics, to be photonics, to be something else. So you're, you're seen as highly employable, plus on the way you've had some really interesting work to do that's very cutting edge. So that end of the things we're not really having an issue with. Um, where we're having to have conversations with government is say this revolution is coming really quickly mm -hmm. now. We need to also reskill at the cryogenics handling, the chemical handling, the advanced tooling kind of end of things. We need to build that whole workforce as a piece. And that needs to be done in conjunction with developing the businesses. What you don't want to do is train a whole lot of people when there's no jobs available sure. at the end of their training period. So you've got to build it piece by piece. And to answer your earlier question that you started off with, you know, why is this happening now? Yeah. It's happening now because now quantum can solve problems that are pain points for people in different sectors of the economy. So not so much computing, although we've heard some really great stuff about sure. that. But 
particularly in terms of precision navigation and timing. There's very high TRL solutions now in both civilian and defence happening in that area. In sensing and imaging, that's going to be a big take up in the next few years. There'll be various things in communication. So I think Quantum's got momentum now as opposed to, say, 10 years from now because it's mature enough now that it's working its way quite fast up the TRL chain and solving problems. Okay, do you guys agree with, with Andrew's uh, sort of uh, focus on those technologies that sort of are preceding the, the quantum computing revolution and that that's gonna kind of be the first, uh, those will be the first technologies to kind of hit the market or whether that's the government market or the private sector and obviously we'll get into those clients later, but is that sort of broadly the pathway that you guys see forward as well, George, if you wanna? I've learned early on never to disagree with Andrew. Uh, <laughs> but in general, I, I completely agree. But there's even a broader term, right? It's not we're just competing for other STEM resources. We have significant other industries that are also growing rapidly. So it's competing in like, and you know, if you are like a policy planner in government or other places especially, you have to make decisions on STEM versus not STEM as well. And where does that money go? If you like fundamental resources like nurses and teachers that are still lacking in many, many, many economies. So where do you make those decisions? So it's competition for resources across pretty much everything that we have, we just don't have enough people of the right numbers and the right skills. And we have an added problem in quantum is we don't know what those right numbers and right skills are for the industry as yet. So we are competing against established industries that have those numbers. So all of that is essentially just to say is we need to start now and we need to prepare our ecosystems now to kind of have a chance of not being in trouble when the need is you know, more, uh, more desperate. David, does it make sense to, to focus you know, our, our, the workforce efforts, the infrastructure efforts on the kind of technologies that, that Andrew mentioned at the start? I mean, do you feel like that's the same kind of pathway? Yeah, I, I think I agree with all of this. I, I'm not sure I would say quantum computing will be the initial driver because yep. I think sensing and communication yep. are already happening yep. at metropolitan scales quite well. Uh, I think they're all important and they're all doing very well, but I, I don't think it's obvious which will come first. I'm not really even sure that's important, frankly because the number of applications emerging as people learn more and more about this is rapidly increasing. At the end of the day, it's what you're saying. You need the people, but also you need the supply chain. So we haven't talked much about that, but a lot of the components for building quantum technologies need supply chain, single photon detectors, right? Appropriate amplifiers, modestly priced cryogenics. All this stuff has to form as well, and we need to pay attention to that. And, and obviously all of that stuff costs a lot of money, yeah. as well, right? And uh, there's not really like a revenue stream for this industry yet. Uh, so, so where is where is that? I feel like Andrew has something. I'm, I'm just gonna disagree a little Go bit. Go ahead, all right. At, at, <laughs> at the end of the, the sensing and so on, there is a revenue stream. Okay. We actually have companies exporting globally and not just to, to each other, the quantum ecosystem. It's going out now into markets where it's solving problems. Mm -hmm. So quantum, if you just think of a quantum computing, then you're right. There's no revenue stream substantial to, to build those businesses. That's still people investing in. But there are businesses growing organically at the other end of the, the system. Okay. So they can afford the equipment because they're, they're getting paid by their customers. They're already solving problems. So it's a really wide spectrum. So I think you, you can't look at it through the lens of it's a hard problem that we're going to start solving 10, 20 years from now. Yeah. It, it, it's an ecosystem already. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, the, the obvious follow-up is, is that revenue stream sufficient to build out these ecosystems in the capacity that you guys are, are, are that we're all talking about, right? I mean, or, or is something else going to be needed? Uh, <laughs> it could be you or something I'm, I'm going to throw over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no, like, clear answer as to X, Y, Z is needed, but, yeah. you know, just to kind of piggyback off what uh, David started, I think the supply chain starting with the materials required to, you know, all the way to the other end of standards, right? We don't have, for example, lasers. We don't have exact standards of what we need because we don't know how many we need. There are probably 10 laser companies in the world that make precision instruments needed. If you don't have a standard, they're building 10 different things, which means we are reducing the number of what we need versus telling them, build to this, and then therefore we have 10 suppliers. There's all those kind of machinations and problems in the global supply chain that are not single person, single government controlled. They are all nodes in this vast complex network, perhaps requires a quantum computer to solve, about where the gaps are. That in itself is part of the challenge, is trying to work our way through. It's nascent, it's coming, um, and we need a lot of kind of focus on it. The added complexity with us is geopolitics, right? Is the, sure. There's factions because we don't know what the promise is, and if you don't know what the promise is, you don't know what the risk is, and if you don't know what the risk is, you don't know. So that creates a whole level of angst, both from a 
geopolitics perspective as well as from an individual industry perspective, right? Whether you're in financial services or defense or you know, life sciences, if you're a major industrial in that space, you're still competing. You have quarterly reports to fill. You have shareholders to worry about. So that's how complex the ecosystem is when you're trying to build, to use your analogy, a plane as you're trying to fly it. Yeah. You're actually trying to find piece parts of the plane as you're trying to fly it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of this. Uh, I think the United States was in a really uh, different situation in the history of electronics where they had major sort of quasi-monopolies like Bell Labs sure. and IBM and HP that did an enormous amount of basic materials research yeah. in the same location that drove technologies, yeah. right? And when you look at the mercurial, say, advances, the invention of the transistor and lasers and look at these tech developments, you know, almost all of them happened in industry. Yeah. So now, you know, 2022, we're in a very different place. Those companies are largely gone with basic research, with, of course, IBM. <laughs> you guys are doing great. I used to work at IBM, so yeah. just that we're clear. <laughs> Jay's still here. Yeah. Um, but by and large, a number of the other places, that environment has disappeared. So I would say, to a degree, the playing field is pretty level now, okay. which it makes it a very different game. And uh, again, in some ways, it's much more interesting. Uh, the materials issue is a good one, because a lot of the basic materials work was done in industry. You know, in the United States, it's awfully hard to get tenure in American university for growing a crystal. Right? Yeah. On the other hand, at universities around the world, that does happen. The culture is very different. Mm -hmm. So again, I think by working together and collaborating strongly, we can do very well here. Yeah, and if we have this, I mean, you know, like you said, supply chains are global now. Uh, right. I, and I think, you know, my, my understanding, I, I'm more of a microchip guy, honestly, so I, I follow it really closely. And, uh, you know, East Asia is the center of all of that. Is that also true in the quantum space when it comes to the equipment, at least, or, and all the things that you sort of need to, to build the infrastructure around this? How key is sort of that region in particular? Um, to, to all this? So I think it's hard to generically answer that. Sure. So, but you know, uh, in the sort of quantum sensing and communication space, I would argue a little bit what George was saying, a lot of the laser companies uh, that make precision lasers are overseas. The same is true for advances in cryogenic companies. Yeah. Say the same is true to some degree for a single photon detection. So it's globally distributed. It doesn't mean that the United States isn't doing well, but uh, it's no longer the only or necessarily the best place to go for certain technologies. So it is different. Yeah, and obviously we, we've all lived through the pandemic and the aftermath and have seen how supply chains, you know, <laughs> mess up. Uh, even much simpler supply chains can get snarled. So like a dishwasher. Obviously there's a, yeah, sure, and, or, or, <laughs> or microchips. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot more inputs that I think go into these quantum technologies. So there's a, a lot of sort of breakage and potential failure points. Is that right? Yeah. And, and the pandemic disrupted it in weird ways mm -hmm. around the world. So, for example, my colleagues in Europe were saying they couldn't get raspberry pies for love nor money. Yeah. They were freely available in Australia throughout the pandemic. We were in that hemisphere it wasn't a problem but then we had other issues we couldn't get cryogenic stuff out of Europe to Australia it was just too hard so it, it, it you know the, the pandemic focused the mind on you get we can't go forward with the old model yeah. of a we all just depend on a global supply chain that seamlessly operates because that's unlikely to happen anymore Okay, so is there a sense then that we kind of need to build uh, domestic sort of silos for these like uh, incoming quantum supply chains? That there's going to have to be sort of like a North American quantum supply chain and an, an Australian, East Asian quantum supply chain? Or yeah, I mean, to what extent? No, it no. seems like there's sort of maybe a balance there. Not but. domestic, but don't put all your eggs in the China basket. Yeah. Sure. Right, and yeah. and particularly have some kind of arrangements where you can easily trade between partners and work together. You know, Australia, the U.S. is one example with Japan with our friends in Europe, you know, um, uh, because at the moment there's still a lot of points of friction in the supply chain as well, particularly quantum is a developing industry, so you start hitting export control and ITAR things, yeah. particularly if you're a small business, uh, and that can really provide friction when you're, when you're trying to develop out the business. Yeah. Although I, I would argue these bilateral agreements that the U.S. has been signing with different countries has really helped. Absolutely. Uh, it's reduced this friction quite there a bit. There was one with France, right? That I think yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, quite a number now. And, uh, and just one recently was Switzerland, for example. It's, it's very helpful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, I did not bring up China first. I just want to make that clear. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, now it has so. been invoked. Uh, so um, <laughs> they, I, they politically correct Australian. No <laughs> so I, did, I do want to ask uh, two questions, really. I mean, so one, it sounds like a lot of the infrastructure for quantum is coming out of China, which obviously I know in Washington would raise some national security concerns. Uh, I, actually, that, that, no? Okay. no. I mean, a lot of the infrastructure that comes out of China is the basic high-end electronics infrastructure. The, yeah. the, the, 
the, the frequency control, the, the power supplies, et cetera. But the specialist infra infrastructure, you know, for cryogenics that comes out of Europe, Europe. Um, uh, with some out of the US. Uh, for um, some of the materials, uh, it comes out of the US or, again, uh, Europe or Israel. So it, it's very, I, I agree with David, you cannot generalize on this because it depends on which technology platform. But there, no one owns quantum technology at the moment. Yeah. And no one owns standards. I mean, that's the other important yeah. thing. Um, we have a real opportunity here because we're, again, taking from David's lead, we're working with industry together in a way that we really haven't done it before. We can, and, and picking up on the lasers point, we could develop standards as we go. And if you develop those standards, that really speeds up development of the industry. It simplifies things for new players. Uh, and so that's a very important place to keep an eye on. Yeah, uh, to stick with the Chinese. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of concern, I think, across the board with, with technology standards. And I think there's, in many cases, kind of a... a dual, you know, com competing rival approaches, which you often see, I think, China and to a lesser extent Russia will push, you know, for one standard in sort of like the digital ecosystem space uh, and the U.S. and the Western allies will push back. I is that a dynamic in quantum at this point or is it too early to, for, for any of that to have sort of be, be played out at this point? I, I'm not aware of that dynamic okay. happening. Yeah. Uh, and even if it was to happen at this point, it's too early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think. Um, on the think. on the revenue question, uh, and you know, I think we got into that earlier. This idea that like th there are some early stage sort of things coming in. Um, obviously, that's not going to be for everything. Uh, and and I know governments around the world, uh, obviously here and, and in Australia, are very interested in this space uh, for defense applications, but also eventually for commercial applications. Um, on the revenue question specifically, how much support are you guys expecting you will need from governments, whether that's national, state, local? Uh, in order to build these systems? I mean, is, is it something that, are we talking like, you know, greater than 50%, uh, particularly at this early stage, or, or do you guys feel like it's more of an advisory, ancillary role? And I'm just, I guess I'm just curious the extent to which government's going to be central to these efforts. I think we uh, position that question with any, uh, a historical lens for any new technology. I think a lot of traditional government approaches has been on the basic research of the TR at early levels, but I think all governments around the world are quickly learning that there is a big gap between that and where industry can pick up. And even what we might consider mature industries now still are in some ways subsidized by government because it needs to provide that function for continuity so that stuff doesn't get spilled between the gaps. Uh, and that's going to continue for quantum for a good long while before it is ready. The biggest buyer, the biggest funder for quantum from a user perspective is going to be governments for a while because a lot of the applications is what they're looking at. I mean, there are many industries, don't get me wrong, that are looking at it significantly, but if you look at percentage, I would suspect it's going to be for And it's different answers for domains of quantum as well, very different answers yeah. versus networks versus compute versus what. Yeah, so, so what, what are the areas where government is most interested in, in investing and, and otherwise sort of like leaning in? I'm, I'm sure it does vary. So like, you know, if you could, uh, uh, cryptology, you know, like cryptography. And, and again, it's, huge, uh, to Dr. Afshalam's point, it's very hard to generalize in general because yeah. each government has a very different perspective on it. Uh, so uh, the first day of the, of the conference, we had like a, a, a three hour session with government leads from a number of you know, 13, 14 countries talking across borders to try to figure out what those things are. It was fascinating to hear the completely different thought processes and approaches and philosophies that kind of lead in into what somebody's doing. It depends on size of the country, amount they've invested, when they started investing in the 1960s versus five years ago. That all kind of adds to it. But the key thing that came out of it is there's not enough people, not enough money, not enough time to focus. So we have to work together to make it happen. Yeah, David, can we talk a little bit about sort of because you're you're in you're in Chicago, right? You're in you're in Illinois. Right. I think um, you know, it, I, I think a lot of people here probably understand why Washington is interested in this stuff, uh, right? Um, state governments, I think, is a little more nebulous, and so I'm curious, you know, where you see. I, I don't know if Illinois is supporting your research or if you guys are looking to do that uh, or your your industry development. Where where's the state government's role in this? So uh, I can answer that. Let, let me also quickly mention, I think the one other important role that the government has in this in general is uh, absorbing risk. Okay. So a lot of work yeah. in both basic research but also in prototype technology development ends up in failure. And I think you need to be able to absorb risk to get the successes. And I think the government plays a critical role in that. The state, I can only speak for one. 
You sure? Yeah. I'd like to speak for more, but <laughs> actually I wouldn't like to speak for more. <laughs> uh, uh, they've been incredibly supportive. Yeah. So uh, at every level, both in terms of um, opening up resources in the state, say to build quantum networks, uh, but also in, in capital investments. So in Illinois, for example, the governor of Illinois has invested $200 million in a joint research facility uh, for industry to work with faculty and national lab scientists all in one place as sort of a new dynamic. It's a major investment for a state, particularly in a tough financial time. Yeah. So to me, that's an amazing measure of their support for the long term. Uh, let's, let's talk Australia. I mean, it's, it's similar at the, so Australia is also a federal system. Yeah. We only have six states, not 50, so it's a little <laughs> bit simpler. Um, but the various states are focusing on uh, very, various things where there's expertise in the state. So Adelaide has a very strong focus on precision navigation and timing for both defence and uh, civilian applications and then has invested in that space. Uh, Sydney, there's a thing called the Sydney Quantum Academy and they're very focused on developing quantum computing and Michelle Simmons, silicon quantum computing, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the scale of the investment is not quite as much as Illinois, or, although We'll, we'll try, we'll try and match. <laughs> um, but the governments are doing it for selfish reasons. They want a future workforce. They want future high-tech industry. They want, uh, in Australia's sense, we're a small population. So we're all about value add, low physical, low physical size, high value add export. Sure. And quantum technology is perfect for that. So it, it, it makes sense. Uh, and then also post-pandemic, the federal government just announced this week a uh, national reconstruction fund of about 16 billion of which one billion is focused on advanced technologies. And the three technologies called out by the federal minister uh, were in order quantum, uh, AI, and robotics. So it's, it's that, it's, that's the focus. And they're doing it for selfish reasons. And quantum's at the top. Quantum's at the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't alphabetical for a change. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and obviously, um, that's a big deal in Australia. But uh, you know, here in the US, uh, we just passed a um, very big piece of legislation, the Chips and Science Act. And obviously, you know, the focus is on the chips part of that, because that's where the money was actually appropriated. So we'll see to what extent the money actually comes to NSF and these other agencies uh, that uh, you know, I think uh, President Biden talks all the time about boosting uh, uh, federal spending as a percentage of GDP on science and tech. Um, how bullish are all of you, or I guess the two of you, the Americans here, uh, that um, there's going to be a real impact on quantum industry and sort of the development of quantum industry as a result of that bill and I think broader efforts to really focus federal, um, federal science agencies in a more sort of like applied or translational tech direction. Um, National Science Foundation is looking, well they are, they're building a technology and innovations partnership uh, directorate, all of that stuff. Like how, how important do you guys see that to this effort to build up a quantum industry ecosystem? I think the US federal government has been really leaning in into quantum uh, even before the two acts that you mentioned, CHIPS and IRA. Uh, we heard from uh, Ann Neuberger yesterday uh, with regard to that commitment uh, from this administration, the prior administration. It's a very clear, to me at least, uh, a visible presence in their levels of investment across multiple agencies uh, from DOD to DOE to NSF to Commerce through NIST and EDA and a number of others from that investment. Clear kind of value that they see not just for uh, US national security, but you know the balancing of that for industry, for creation, for not just the US, for like-minded countries as well. So from, from where I sit, uh, and we sit close to the federal government here, but uh, from where I sit, yeah, definitely we see that they are in and they're contributing and they want to try to help figure how to stand up ecosystems in multiple parts. David, are you confident that some of that science money in the Chips and Science Bill is gonna ultimately help you guys out here? Yeah, I think it is important to remember Chips and Science Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm extremely bullish on this. Okay. I think there's an enormous amount of goodwill to make this happen. I think we're seeing it in the overlap with microelectronics in the quantum space, which is mm. very significant, as you know, yeah. for materials development, you know, building national databases for quantum simulation. Uh, it's one of those, personally, I think, relatively rare moments where all political parties seem to gather on the importance of doing this. Uh, so I'm very confident it will happen. It's incredibly important because these are significant investments in infrastructure that only they can make. Yeah. So. Do you guys ever get kind of like the blank face from government when you guys go and ask, you know, talk about some of these quantum applications and the industry uh, uh, potential here? I mean, do you feel like 
because it's a complicated technology. I mean, there's a lot of different like things going on for policymakers, and, and it's not always the easiest to sort of explain the use cases. I mean, again, in a lot of cases, we don't really know what all the use cases are going to be for these quantum science uh, endeavors. So, um, I guess I guess what I'm asking is, how do you best message this to government, uh, and 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 when do you sort of struggle, uh, and do they ever look at you and say like? I don't see a business case here yet. You got to come back to me with like a little harder sort of scientific, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, you, you know, basically some proof here that this is going to be uh, a commercially viable option. Yeah, I, I, I just want to jump in and say, you know, a few years ago I was seriously concerned about this, okay. partly due to some arrogance as a physicist. Uh, but the more we've been engaged with the government in uh, trying to bridge this gap, the more I believe this is not, actually not an issue. So I, I think most politicians understand the importance of doing this now. I don't expect that the Diagon Law is a Hamiltonian, but <laughs> you think they should? No. <laughs> um, but I'm always impressed of how quickly they appreciate the importance of doing this early. Sure. I think they understand the potential impacts in areas like medicine and environment and defense, and, but largely economic, as you both were saying. Um, and I don't want to take too much time, but I have to tell you when a group of us were working on the National Quantum Initiative Act and had a chance to speak uh, to some politicians, personally, I remember a brief discussion with one that I, well, let's just say I, I had a, not a high opinion of um, in the hallway and I was speaking to him because I was stunned how supportive he was sure. mm. of building this quantum infrastructure. And I asked him, I said, I have to tell you personally, I'm surprised and really you know, delighted by your enthusiasm. Could you tell me why? And what he said was to me very illuminating was that, you know, many years ago, well, let's just say he was from Texas. Uh, sort of put this together. Yeah. Yeah, I'm worried about this. Uh, but said that, uh, you know, if we had not moved early to build infrastructure and electronics and manufacturing, you know, Texas and Austin and you know, the education for our students would never be where we are today. And I thought actually it was a pretty sobering moment to realize mm. he got the entire picture, yeah. right? And I think people see that. So I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic. I don't know what your view is. Yeah, I, this is a conversation Andrew and I have had for like two years now is this concept that we call ex executive awareness. It's for executives in government and policy and industry that look at the word quantum and thinks it's either a physics or an IT issue. And then it's, that's the extent of the, of the conversation. So when you're talking about education, it's that awareness building in the general community on not what it is, but how do you react to it and how do you need to know, what do you need to know to be supportive? And that part, I think there is some work to be, I, I don't think we need to explain the word quantum anymore. The fact that uh, the ad that they showed earlier, the next Marvel movie is called Quantumania, <gasps> means it's, it's in the public zeitgeist. It's more a question now of the people that make decisions for industry, for government, for policy, to get them to that next level of this is why you should care and this is what the impact might be. Yeah. And Andrew, I want to I want to turn to you and, and ask, you know, the extent to which Australia that, that that's a similar dynamic in Australia, but I also want to just first kick this to everybody. Um, in my experience in Washington, you know, when you are trying to sell a new sort of like tech ecosystem uh, to policymakers, you're really doing it wrong if you're not talking about China and saying, listen, like if we don't do this, the Chinese will. The Chinese are already doing it. Um, so I guess Andrew to start out. Uh, you know, to what extent do you feel similarly that the government gets the quantum stuff and, and is sort of ready to help and maybe that's changed over the last few years? And um, are you guys messaging, you know, hey, if, you, if we don't do this, China will? So we're, we're small, so China is not our concern. Yeah. And in fact, they're our largest trading partner. Yeah. So we are very economically connected to China. Now, what we worry about, and again, both political parties now for a long time, there's been over 20 years of investment in quantum in Australia, regardless of who's in government, mm -hmm. both sides get it. It's been a long time since we've had the blank face. Very early on, you had to explain quantum is not magic. It's not Harry Potter. Sure. Um, and, and those were early valuable conversations to have. Now that's not a problem, they get it. It can be an incremental advance in some sector, or it can be a step change, or it can be something science fiction you couldn't do before. But the conversations we do have is, OK, Australia's got a set of unique problems to do with our physical size, our low population, the weird population density. OK, we have identified problems and pain points. Where will quantum help? And once you have those conversations, the politicians grok it really quite immediately. And they can see, and they're OK with long time scales. 
Um, you know, one of the things we're very good at is mining. Um, it turns out open pit mines are often a GPS denied environment because the walls are so high you can't see the satellite constellation. So something that had been perhaps a defense concern or a civil aviation concern suddenly becomes a mining concern. And that's a customer base, they get that, there's a lot of support. And whether it's government as first customer, and in defense is a great first customer, it de-risks it, as you were saying. Yeah. But then if it has flow onto the, the civilian aspects of the economy, that's fantastic. So no, government has been very supportive for a very long time. Where the US excels, and where Australia, I think, has a lot of lessons to learn, is translating that brilliant research into economic impact. Yeah. So in the last couple of years, we've had a great lift. We've now got 25 spin-off or start-up companies in Australia uh, in the quantum tech sector, um, about 10 of which are exporting, uh, and that's in a population far smaller than California's. Um, but that has only really taken off in the last couple of years. George and David, really quickly, how much does, uh, does China come up in, in, David, your conversations with unnamed uh, Texas lawmakers or, or anybody in government, uh, how, how often is, is that kind of the, the, the elephant in the room in, in these conversations? You know, I, I, I think people are mindful of the fact that not everyone knows what's going on. I think people vaguely are aware of the level of investment, but uh, you know, money isn't absolutely everything. Uh, and I think most of the discussion is focusing on how can we compete effectively. Sure. Not so much of that fear-driven exercise, but um, how can we compete and how can we collaborate with people who do want to collaborate? And uh, we were saying a little bit before the session started, when you look at major scientific endeavors, the space station, right, the Hubble telescope, you look at massive successes in science and technology, which governments benefit from, yeah. it happens through these interactions, right, that take tens of years to develop. I don't think this field is so different, frankly. Uh, I think it would benefit us to collaborate with as many people as possible, but I don't think that's the exclusive driver. Obviously, people are mindful of it, and obviously, people pay attention to the level of investment. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, very similar. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, sometimes it gets overestimated in some of the decision-making rooms on how much that in itself is a factor, because it's a factor in everything. You know, competitiveness and national security is a factor in everything. I mean, like, like uh, the three of us are kind of focused on building ecosystems that are regional and national and kind of collaborative. And in those discussions, these things are there, but not really part of the day-to-day -day in most of the decision-making that needs to get done. Yeah. Uh, and one of the you know things that we had chatted about before is whether that helps raise money and it, not directly, not related, but it is included in everything. So when you're kind of building innovation based ecosystems of any new deep tech, it's always a balance between where do you put money and where do you put people. And from a national government perspective, any national government is that balance in quantum is between growing companies and industry versus protecting national security secrets. And there's always that fine balance that goes between it. And there's a ton of dual use technologies of various types that we have lots of learnings from the last 100 years on how to kind of bridge and create demilitarized zones between the two and kind of work. I'm not saying that that's all perfect and works great and it's wonderful, but there's been enough thought done and we know what the silos are, we know where the pain points are, we know where they break down, how good we are at solving it, I'm not so sure, but we at least know where those channels are. Yeah, and I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just about to say, to follow on David's point too, that the gain from the international collaboration, both scientifically and technology, is, is huge. So LIGO, uh, fantastic, you can measure gravity waves. Uh, were upgraded in the last few years with squeezes, which is arguably the first large-scale use of quantum technology for scientific gain. The squeezes were built in Australia, but we could never have afforded a gravity wave observatory, but we're very good at making squeeze light. They were brought to the US, put into the Louisiana and, and, and Washington state. Yep. Um, that working together benefits everybody, and quantum technology across the board, it's going to be like that. Yeah, and you know, you guys are talking about this, we talked about this earlier. Um, Collaboration, you know, obviously all three of you, and I think probably the ecosystems around the world, uh, my understanding is there's a lot of cross-pollination, there's a lot of sort of support and cooperation. Industry is ultimately about competition, right? Uh, it's about making more money than the other guys. Um, at what point does, do these ecosystems, you know, start to tip uh, a little bit away from this collaboration, cooperation into more competition? That would suggest sort of a more mature industry starting to grow. Um, when do you guys see that happening? What's the timeline? And how are you guys going to navigate that? Because right now, obviously, everybody's kind of hand in glove. Um, when does that sort of fall apart? I, 
you know, I, I think there are examples of that. I think in the past, Semitech was an example of that, right? Okay. With the electronics industry, yeah. fiercely competing companies worked together brilliantly to make roadmaps, right? Yeah. Share tech developments, but then they did go into their corners, right? To yeah. do their own thing. And I think that's strategically clever. I think the same thing personally will happen in quantum. Okay. Uh, when that, like going to the corners begins to happen, I think as applications emerge and their internal knowledge and comfort with quantum technology gets to a level where they feel they can do that. Yeah. I'm pretty bad at predicting these things, but the five year-ish to 10 year-ish timeframe seems reasonable to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's, it's impossible to predict because, again, it depends on what domain of quantum you're talking about and specifically within that domain what industry you're talking about. But I, I think in general these things tend to have natural lives where as long as it is more productive and advantageous for the players to partner, de-risking, lower investments required for higher returns, better access to the right types of people because there's just not enough of them, they will work together. And the moment there's enough of each one of those, then it is okay to compete. I think that, to me, it takes a natural kind of evolution. So even between the three of us and many other kind of, you know, what you might call regional ecosystems in the world, there's so much conversation. But what's going on, where it is, if we are going to start doing something and you are also doing it, let's compare notes or let's not do the same thing because it's just not enough people and let's kind of exchange stuff. There's a lot of that also starting to happen very organically. Yeah. And, and because there's not enough people and there's not enough money at the moment, it really makes sense if I'm aware that Quantum Chicago is doing something, well, I'm, I'm not going to do that in Australia. It would make no sense, you know, but we'll do something complementary and maybe learn from each other. In fact, shamelessly steal from each other the good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it gets to the point that we're absolutely saturated with people, then it would change. But Silicon's a brilliant example. The Silicon roadmaps are worked on, as you say, by fiercely competing uh, companies, and they have for decades. But as, a, as a, a, a sector, it's beautifully laid out. Yeah. I mean, Apple and Samsung co you know, compete enormously, yet they collaborate on quite a few projects. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Certainly not unique to the quantum space, but I think just because things are so early, uh, yeah. it, it's, it's worth, and I think it's, you know, for everybody, when you see folks start going to their corners, I think that may be a good time to, to start actually looking, you know, to, at, at the industry starting to, to, to grow yeah. and, and maybe blossom at that point. Is that a fair sort of way to look at it? I think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. And, and, go ahead. And, well, it's clear that none of us are good at predicting this because neither of us flew here on our private jet. Right? <laughs> we, we flew commercial, so, you know. Yeah, just to be clear, I personally know nothing about making money, although yeah. I, 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 I'm rather good at spending it. But. Yeah, well, I'm a journalist, so same here. Yeah, uh, but, but, but I do, I do want to ask, you know, the, the idea of learning uh, how to build these systems. Um, quantum is very new, uh, you know, regardless of the diff different areas. Um, there are other emerging technologies that I think in, in recent memory have gone from uh, very sort of esoteric and, and difficult to sort of really pin down the, the, the business use cases, I'm thinking of AI, right, into something that has now everywhere uh, and making gobs of money for everybody. Um, are you guys looking at AI specifically as kind of a, a roadmap here? Does that make sense? Uh, is there any other technologies that, that uh, you guys can look at and say, like, that's how they did it, that's how we should do it? Or is quantum unique in, in this way? It's, I, to me, and this is just personal opinion. You know, We actually conducted an exercise kind of strangely just to see what it would look like to kind of map kind of job and revenue growth across a number of things that combined might make quantum, which included AI, cyber, semiconductor, a bunch of them and started doing the sticks together and saying if you combine all of them, would that what quantum look at? But it's just a theoretical exercise because we don't really kind of know because quantum is not one either. So that's sure. where the challenge truly comes in. Yeah, no, I, I, we've been engaged with some of those as well. We don't do it, but our colleagues like in the business schools do this. And so we've asked them, how do you develop these types of exercises yeah. and uh, predictions? And there are huge error bars on this, and they, uh, they tell us what they've done, and I think it's, people are following the same thing. So uh, that's a great question. I, I don't exactly know what the best answer to this is, frankly. Sure. Uh, but you know, one thing we haven't touched on here that they pointed out to us many years ago, which I think governments do need to think about are the role of policy in driving this technology and this business, and uh, particularly for public acceptance of the technology. Yeah. So, I think for businesses personally to be successful, this will have to be dealt with at some level and probably best to do it early yeah. rather than later. Yeah, uh, Andrew, if you want to say anything? So just on the, um, the, the learning from machine learning, for example, sure. or AI, well, one of the things that's shown to us is the importance of getting hardware into people's hands. 
Because a lot of what has now happened in machine learning, if you went five, ten years ago and said, oh, you'll be able to type spider into your photos app on your phone, and it will find all the photos of spiders. I'm from Australia. We have a lot of <laughs> spiders. Um, people would have said that's ridiculous. But you built the hardware. People started experimenting. And we'll see the same thing in the quantum tech space. These early hardware plays are important because mm -hmm. people will discover new things that they did not realize they could do. A bit, bit harder to find like consumer-facing applications for, for quantum technologies, though, right, than AI? Or, oh, or am I oh, oh, no, 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 no. Because um, if you talk to physicists, we've got this very narrow conception of what the, of the applications are. So I was looking at someone recently who was wanting to do a quantum tech to, uh, in, a, in a, you know, you think you put bananas and apples in and you make juice. They were oh, wanting blender. To, blender. Uh, blender. <laughs> Neutralizer, yeah. whatever I, you call it. Neutralizer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they, they wanted a quantum tech there to do real-time measurements of the, the vitamin yeah. component, right? That's a very consumer-facing app. It turns out to be a hard problem to do for a variety of reasons. It's a really boring application from, from a quantum, basic quantum point of view, but it's definitely consumer-facing. So we're going to see a lot of these come up, um, and there'll be surprises to us. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and, and, I th and I think consumers, all of us, are interested mm -hmm. in information security. Yeah. I think everybody with a credit card is interested in information security. So I, I, I do think there's a lot of public engagement in that level. I think impacts on medicine and diagnostic from sensing will likely happen in the nearer term for targeted diagnostics. Uh, so I don't know about having it in people's hands, but I think people reaping the benefits of this, uh, I think that may happen sooner than one might imagine. And, and we're running very short on time, so I want to oh. try to get one more question in. And uh, I think I'll just kick it to George. Uh, it's a big one. Um, how could this go wrong? How, how could this effort to commercialize quantum fall apart? Again, looking back on history, right? The science may not arrive in time. The technology engineering problems may be not good enough to make it economically viable. There may be challenges in revenue stream. What we talk about as supply chain is looking at what we think the supply chain should be based on what we know today. And the quantum supply chain and what that is, we don't know and we should be thinking a completely new. Don't look at what we do today. So that could be different. There might be some stop gaps in there. Those are some of the ways. Then hype, of course, right? The hype cycle is always dangerous, uh, which is what happened with the example with AI. The AI winter was because the hype cycle was so high, people lost faith in the timing. So that's the stuff that I worry about that we have to kind of manage against. Very quickly, you guys uh, have any thoughts on that, how this could fall apart? No, I, I agree. Although I, I think uh, the community has, been, has learned from that a bit. And uh, while there is some hype in the quantum space, I think it pales compared to some other things that have happened in the past. I'm not saying it isn't too high, but I do think it's, it's uh, a little bit more we, we talk about it on stage now. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm in violent agreement. Part of the piece is education, and, and also you were picking up earlier on kind of responsible research and innovation. We're baking that in as we go. So we're constantly having those conversations with people, so there's public acceptance. Yeah. It's not seen as a fearful thing, but it's as an empowering thing. And I, and I think that that's the way to avoid it. Well, the clock is telling us that we're, we're over time, but uh, I really want to thank all three of you for today. It was super, super interesting, and uh, thank you everybody for, for uh, checking this out. And I think, you know, what we're going to see uh, when folks start to run for their corners, I think that's when people should start investing in some of these quantum <laughs> companies, maybe, because that'll be, <laughs> that'll be a, a sign that commercialization is imminent. But, uh, but again, thanks to, to all three of our panelists, and uh, thanks, thanks to all of you. Okay, folks, feel free. I know that uh, some of you had been in the back there. Feel free to come on in and grab a seat if you like. We have one more speaker in the plenary this morning. And, um, but before we get to our next speaker, let me make a couple of uh, summary remarks uh, from our plenaries. Uh, after this next uh, talk, the lunch will be provided as it was yesterday out in the atrium. We've got the education gallery open. The exhibitors are there. Please stop by and see them. Um, our sponsors, many of the sponsors will be out there as well. 
uh, with the exhibitors and uh, just a great time to continue to build the network around quantum. Uh, this, this last group was tr just fantastic and we talk about building the ecosystem and doing it responsibly, right? We wanna go and we wanna go fast and we want it to be responsible at the same time. So that's important. I do wanna say a special thanks to the international community uh, for coming. You can see the flags represented here, but again, we had uh, 17 countries represented here in collaboration, many of them already collaborating with the United States, many of them collaborating already with each other um, in the global community, and we so appreciate that. You've heard this morning in multiple sessions how important it is for that, uh, for that collaboration to continue. Um, so at one o'clock the afternoon breakout start, these sessions are fantastic. It's probably the best depth on, for a quantum conference I think that you could imagine anywhere on the planet. And um, so if you would uh, make the time to look ahead and say which sessions would you like to go to, go to those sessions, participate. And then at 3.30, we're going to have Quantum World Congress 2022 party. And that Quantum World Congress party, again, uh, sponsored by the government of France and Connected DMV. We look forward to just a great time to continue to develop those friendships and those networks out in the atrium. So that will take us through the rest of the day for this inaugural Quantum World Congress. We so appreciate the plenary session for all of you participating um, in this way. I'd also like to say a quick thanks while we're all together here in this setting, um, again, to our sponsors, to the countries that have participated, to the United States government, for all of the participation and support that they lend to this as well. And I'd like to say a special thanks to our region here, the DMV as we call it, in, uh, in Greater Washington, where we've had great participation from Maryland, DC and Virginia. And um, you're gonna hear more about that here from our next speaker. I'd also like to thank um, our connected DMV team. So uh, George Thomas, who you just heard from, our chief innovation officer and master visionary for Quantum World Congress 2022, has just been a stellar leader on this. And uh, Dana Magnuson, who is uh, running our, the event so that we can all, all of this functions and operates well. Sarah Dole for running all our comms and marketing and amplifying a lot of the messaging that you're putting out in the marketplace as we kind of present and actually achieve a more unified operation than existed two days ago when we first came together. So let's give them a, a round of applause. I'll say I'm truly honored to introduce our next speaker. Governor Larry Hogan is the 62nd governor of the state of Maryland. He's in his second term and, all, and by all accounts is a great, has been great for Maryland and for our broader DMV region. Our two key conference themes here are about building the ecosystem and accelerating it in a responsible way and also driving international collaboration to an even greater degree than it existed already. These are both core competencies. Both of these things are core competencies uh, for Governor Hogan. He has a strong business perspective from his years in industry. And when you combine that with his public service, it provides him that full set of capabilities these past eight years to really help and, and uh, build and create the environment where quantum can thrive. I'll tell you, he presented um, a year and a half ago to a group of 75 leaders here in the, in the greater Washington region who are together making a, co a commitment to pursue uh, quantum and to do it well. And he was encouraging us at that moment to do just that. So we're, we're so pleased to be hearing from him here today. Um, Dr. Pines, Governor Hogan, Chris Monroe, and others have worked closely in Maryland to collaborate and make this a reality uh, for the rest of our region, our country, and, and to contribute broadly to our efforts here globally. Please welcome the 62nd Governor of the State of Maryland, Governor Larry Hogan, to the stage. Good morning, everybody. It's really great to be here. Thank you very much, Stu. Um, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, the entire Connected DMV team on uh, convening the first of its kind global conference of the best and brightest minds in, uh, in the global quantum field. And thank you all for being here and being a part of it. 
with all of the economic and security challenges we're facing right now, uh, this gathering uh, could not be more timely or more important. And so I want to welcome you all to the National Capital Region, which uh, I believe is undoubtedly one of the top quantum-ready regions in the United States and the world. And I'm especially proud of the role that our state of Maryland has played in creating a robust and unmatched quantum ecosystem, uh, rich with academic research partnerships, industry investment, and critical federal government engagement. We are leading a quantum revolution in our state of Maryland that serves not just our long-term economic benefit, but also advances our critical national security and cybersecurity goals. Maryland is proud to be <clears throat> home to the most educated workforce in America. And with our world-class universities and uh, research, research institutions, uh, they've helped us to build up a strong and steady pipeline of talented, well-trained, skilled workers for the jobs of the future. And as the cyber capital of America, we're home to the premier cyber-related federal government agencies uh, and military installations, including the NSA, the U.S. Cyber Command, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we're also home to the NIH, the FDA, and 74 federal laboratories, which is more than twice as many of any other U.S. state. And federal efforts to advance quantum research and application are also rooted in Maryland, uh, with facilities including the Joint Quantum Institute, uh, the DEVCOM Army Research Lab, uh, the LPS Qubit Collaboratory, and the Naval Air Warfare Center, uh, just to name a few. Maryland's got one of the most qualified and diverse tech workforces in the nation, uh, including the largest concentration of federal employees and contractors. And as a result, we're already home to a growing pipeline of quantum startups, as well as one of the nation's leading quantum companies, IonQ, which last year began trading on the New York, New York Stock Exchange, making it the world's first public quantum computing company. Year after year, Maryland is ranked as one of the most innovative states in America. And it has long been a priority of our administration to support new ideas and new technologies and cutting edge research that can bolster our economy. That support has fostered our nation leading life sciences cluster, which is another area where quantum technology can make a real difference to save lives. We also stand apart when it comes to our academic commitment <clears throat> to quantum research. Yesterday, you heard from Dr. Daryl Pines, the president of our state's flagship institution, the University of Maryland and College Park, which is among the top 10 institutions in the world for quantum computing, and where we have invested more than $300 million into quantum science. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in just the past decade, the University of Maryland has produced more than 100 PhDs in physics with a focus in quantum science. The university now has expanded to seven quantum facilities and more than 200 quantum researchers and distinguished faculty members, including a Nobel Prize winner in quantum physics. The University of Maryland also facilitates the Mid-Atlantic Quantum Alliance, which brings together public and private sector experts from across the region to collaborate on supporting cutting edge quantum innovation. There's no doubt that Maryland is an ideal gateway to the U.S. for those looking to advance and innovate in quantum, which is why last year we launched a first-of-its-kind initiative to help connect international companies with incubators in Maryland in order to ease their transition into the U.S. market. And I recently, recently announced an expansion of this global gateway initiative to provide foreign companies with direct access 
to critical infrastructure, regulatory assistance, and startup resources, and to foster relationships with potential customers and business partners. Earlier this year, during an economic development mission to Europe, I held a roundtable in Paris with leaders in the quantum, defense, and cyber sectors. And we look forward to similar exchanges with many of you here today. Uh, because none of this innovation and transformation is by accident. It's the result of years of groundwork and preparation to attract direct investment, to develop and diversify our approach uh, beyond cybersecurity, and to build over 50 business incubators and research parks, to grow new industries, and to create game-changing opportunities. It's also been a relentless focus of our administration to make Maryland truly open for business. We did this by uh, lowering taxes, uh, fees, and streamlining thousands of regulations, and being unabashedly pro-jobs, pro-business, and pro-innovation. We've also avoided the toxic politics that we see too much of today, and that can cause instability and uncertainty. And my hope is that other states will follow Maryland's example so that together we can form a strong, united quantum network that will ensure that our national and international leadership in this field will continue to flourish. So thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today and congratulations once again on this first ever Quantum World Congress. Thank you very, very much. Dismissed to lunch and to the breakouts, and we'll see you out in the atrium. Welcome to Quantum World Congress 2022.